And I may be kind of at the back of the bus on this one, but something has come up in my church called the Hyper Grace Movement. And I was wondering if you're familiar with that. Um, and what are your thoughts on the Hyper Grace Movement and how have you dealt with it um, if you've encountered that? I have not encountered that. Maybe my colleagues have. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not aware. I mean, I, I can take a stab at what it probably is. Well, but, from, from but, what I've read, it's based on antinomianism. Okay. All right. And so what do you mean? It's, it's, it, you, how, how is it manifesting itself? Uh, it's coming across as um, that the, the, the requirements of the law, the, the fulfillment of the law is, uh, it, the law is rescinded, that you can basically, by God's grace, accomplish anything in your life, do everything you want, um, approach life without any sense of moral obligation to God because you're under grace. Yeah. Um, get, um, get Sinclair Ferguson's book, Devoted to God. And it will be as helpful as anything uh, along these along these lines, because he does he does a masterful job about explaining the way in which, although we are no longer under the law as a means of justification, uh, the law remains for us in terms of our sanctification. And when and God does not justify those whom He does not sanctify, and uh, and so. You have every reason to be very, very uh, concerned about that and not to give anyone who's propounding these things any place of influence in your church and certainly not to allow them to teach classes or anything like that at all for the well-being of your people. We have seven minutes left. Uh, Ryan from Worcester, Ohio. Um, you've spoken in the past about uh, more or less fighting for fully supporting missionaries. Um, in my church context, less than 150, how do, we, how do we grow into that? Or how do we start that if that's what we want to go towards, but we just don't have the, the funds? Right. Well, I, I recognize that the, the, the position, the, well, where we started from on it was that uh, Kep, um, whom you might have met, who's been a career missionary now down in Bolivia for all these years, was the youth pastor when I came here. He was the youth pastor from, I think, about 81 to 85 or 86. And when time came uh, for Kep to, uh, to leave us and uh, to go to his assignment there, I don't want to be unkind to any of the elders that are still around, but we were about to go into the standard format, which is... Uh, Kep and his wife are now going to have to get a projector and a bunch of slides and start running around the country and looking for money. And th then it occurred to us, we said, but wait a minute, he was, he was a salaried person as our youth pastor. I mean, if, if, if you paid a guy to hang around here, why wouldn't you support him to go down there? And so basically it was easy because we just transferred the the resources in that way and then went on from there. And then that became, that became a pattern for us. The simple answer to your question is that a local church can only do what it can do. And therefore, it, it, in your kind of environment, they're probably not able to do that. And so, ideally though, what, what, we, what I would encourage you to do is to partner with other congregations who are like-minded rather than just sending off the person to go and find people. So better that you call someone that you're in partnership with in terms of gospel ministry and say, you know, I've got Joe and Mary here. They're, they've got a clear call. We're able to support them X. It would be a wonderful thing if, if you would do that too so that, it, so that there would be that kind of uh, cohesion and so on. And, and, and then just uh, to build it from there.